Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is a panel um, regarding uh, agency leaders on cryptocurrency, blockchain, and the evolution of a central bank digital currency. Uh, my name is Paul Atkins, and I am very happy to say we have a real all-star cast uh, with us today for this panel. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to go over a few uh, rules and, and some information for you all that is uh, important uh, for everybody to know. First of all, uh, important for all the lawyers in the group, which uh, should be a, a large portion, um, is uh, CLE information. So uh, we have a password uh, that uh, for you all to use, and it is... And so um, we'll, we'll repeat that later on for your information. Uh, we also have the ability to uh, post questions. So um, we will you know, please uh, use the chat feature and to, uh, uh, to post the, your question by raising your hand um, and to indicate that, um, that you have a question to ask and that'll show up on our screen and we'll be able to uh, recognize you and then open uh, your mic. Um, so again, the chat, so raise the, the raise hand function. And uh, direct Zoom telephone participants, if you dial star nine, uh, that is the, uh, the equivalent of that. So, um, uh, so with that, uh, let me uh, uh, introduce our panel uh, members. So we're joined by uh, Brian Brooks, who is the acting controller of the currency. Um, of uh, the Department of Treasury. So many thanks, Brian, for being with us today. Um, Brent McIntosh, who's Undersecretary for International Affairs of the Department of Treasury. And uh, last but not least, uh, Hester Peirce, who is Commissioner at the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. So without further ado, I think what we should do is, uh, uh, you know, allow our uh, esteemed panelists to uh, uh, make some opening remarks about this topic, and then we'll have uh, some discussion and obviously a chance for you all in the audience to uh, pose questions. So, Hester, let me uh, turn it over to you, Madam Commissioner. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you to the Federal Society for hosting this panel. It's a pleasure to be with you all virtually today. I have to note at the outset that the views that I express are my own views and don't necessarily represent those of the Securities and Exchange Commission or my fellow commissioners. As the primary regulator of our capital markets, the SEC is probably not the first agency that you think of with respect to central bank digital currencies, and it shouldn't be. So I am looking forward to the discussion of the myriad issues that CBDCs raise, including really serious privacy concerns. Um, and I, but, but I believe that a lot of the really interesting innovation in crypto is happening outside of the central bank digital currency space fiat currency could be replaced by what I like to call we ought currency. We the people decide what transaction medium we want to use. More generally, blockchain technology offers a new way of coordinating human action by eliminating the need for centralized authorities and dispersing the decision-making to a broad community across the globe. Projects are coming up with creative applications of the technology to upend the financial services industry, records management, logistics, and supply chains, and charitable donations, to name a few. Certainly, some of these will be permission blockchains run by a central party, but a lot of the interesting questions will stem from truly decentralized networks. Decentralized networks run and are owned by the people who use them, and they could offer real competition to some of the biggest companies in the world. A legal and regulatory structure built around the traditional corporate structure may be ill-equipped to handle these networks. The SEC has seen many of these projects firsthand since 2017 and has grappled with the application of our federal securities laws to crypto. The agency uh, relatively early on, a couple years ago, established the FinHub, which is an, a part of the agency that coordinates our approach to digital assets and other financial technology. For an agency comfortably padding around in its 80-year-old statutory robe, the FinHub has been a positive development but there's much work that can be done to make the agency more welcoming to innovation. The fundamental question that often arises is whether digital assets are securities. And if so, they are subject to the federal securities laws and that can be complicated in itself. 
Even when digital assets aren't securities, the SEC's jurisdiction may cover activities relating to digital assets in a variety of ways. So, um, for example, when a registered entity such as a broker or dealer or investment advisor seeks to hold crypto on behalf of customers, it has to do so in a way that's compliant with our securities laws. Moreover, certain sponsors have sought to offer to investors exposure to crypto through traditional investment products, such as an exchange traded product. These ETPs have to receive SEC approval to list and offer and sell their shares. The SEC so far has reject rejected listing applications for Bitcoin ETPs, something I have objected to on the grounds that we've applied heightened standards to these products without any statutory basis to do so. Overall, I'd say that the SEC has had an uneven response to crypto. While we've taken some positive steps, our refusal to provide clear guidance on how to comply with the law, uh, our regulation by enforcement and our seemingly glacial pace in responding to requests for exemptive relief is sending this burgeoning industry a clear signal to set up shop elsewhere and keep Americans off their networks. For those of you that don't follow the commission's day-to-day -day actions in this space, I'll share a few highlights of how the agency has dealt with the fundamental issue of whether a token is a security. In July 2017, prior to my arrival at the commission, the agency issued the Dow report, which was an opening salvo to warn the crypto community that initial coin offerings may be considered sales of securities. It was an odd first case because its facts weren't the typical ICO facts, but it has become the line of demarcation. We talk about pre-DAO cases and post-DAO, uh, pre-DAO projects and post-DAO projects. And the post-DAO projects were deemed to be on notice that the securities laws were something that they had to think about. The Dow report applied the framework drawn from the now famous in crypto circles, Howey Supreme Court case, and it found that the Dow tokens were securities. Briefly summarized, Howey teaches us that regardless of form, something is a security if it represents an investment in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit solely based on the efforts of others. The commission has followed the Dow report with a line of enforcement cases against ICO issuers. I've supported many of these cases, um, especially when they have involved holding people accountable for material misstate misstatements that they made, made while raising money from investors. In other words, fraudsters shouldn't be able to hide behind the crypto label to avoid application of the anti-fraud provisions in the federal securities laws. However, I have not supported most of our enforcement cases against crypto projects for violations of our registration provisions under the securities laws. One of the reasons for my opposition to these cases is that we have failed to put out clear guidance on how a digital asset can be offered without implicating the federal securities laws. Almost any token distribution event will, by the analysis that our cases have employed, fall afoul of the securities laws. In 2019, commission staff attempted to provide guidance and issued a framework for analyzing whether a digital asset has the characteristics of an investment contract, which is the type of security that the Howey test defines. This staff guidance identifies 38 separate characteristics to consider when analyzing whether an offering of digital assets is likely a securities offering. Although I appreciated the attempt, this guidance Provide, it has proved to be too complex and confusing to be of any real use to the public or frankly to ourselves as we analyze what, when something is a security. So I think our job of providing guidance is still one that we need to, uh, we need to take up and, and give more help to folks who are trying to figure out where things stand. So far, only a handful of projects have been able to receive approval from the commission staff to move forward with token distributions. A few projects receive staff no action letters, whereby the staff acknowledges that it will not recommend an enforcement case to be brought against an issuer in the event that the issuer conducts the offering in the manner that it sets, that it sets forth in its incoming request to us. However, the very fact that these projects felt compelled to seek no action relief is actually troubling to me because the facts of the projects at issue were, were such that they seem very unlikely to implicate the securities laws in the first place. A few other projects have distributed tokens pursuant to registered or exempt offerings. A few months ago in September 2020, a project conducted the first registered token, token offering 
after having its registration statement declared effective by the SEC staff. And in 2019, two issuers conducted exempt offerings under Reg A. Um, these are frequently referred to as mini IPOs. The registration process is costly and, and more concerning. Once a token is deemed to be a security, it has to trade as a security, requiring registered broker dealers or exchanges to be involved in secondary transaction certainly puts a damper on the development of a thriving decentralized crypto network. It also raises many unanswered questions on another sensitive subject of the SEC, custody of these digital assets by the registered entities holding these assets. Outside of these projects, the SEC has taken an aggressive stance against ICO issuers for violating the registration provisions of our securities laws. Most disturbingly, some of these enforcement cases have required the tokens to be disabled or destroyed um, or have caused the companies to abandon once promising projects on the verge of becoming reality. I understand that the determination of whether a token is sold as a security is a difficult one. It requires an idiosyncratic analysis that doesn't produce clear guideposts for entrepreneurs to follow. The challenge of discerning a clear legal line is especially difficult with respect to new forms of business and novel technologies. Entrepreneurs may be forced to choose between unpalatable options, either expanding their, ex, expending their limited capital on costly legal consultation and compliance, or foregoing their pursuit of innovation due to fear of becoming subject to an enforcement action, or as some projects do, just completely avoiding the United States. That's why I proposed a regulatory safe harbor earlier this year. The safe harbor would provide network developers with a three-year grace period exempted from the registration provisions of the federal securities laws, but subject to certain disclosure requirements and subject to the anti-fraud provisions of the securities laws. Um, this, this safe harbor would allow them to um, facilitate participation in and the development of a functional or decentralized network and I think that it would be a positive step forward. I have received a range of reactions to the proposal and my goal is to publish a revised proposal in the near future. But there's much more to be done on issues like custody and Bitcoin-based product approvals. I hope that the commission will adopt a more open approach to innovation. I fear otherwise will drive some of the brightest young minds this country has to, over to overseas countries that are more accepting of innovation and that would not be a good thing for any of us. Um, I thank you for, for uh, listening to me and, and I look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists. And speaking of innovation, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian Brooks, who has been a leader in encouraging the industry he regulates to embrace new technologies. And also I think encouraging other regulators to think more creatively about how we can adapt our rules and regulatory framework to modern technologies. Brian, it's all yours. Esther, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks everybody for, uh, for having me today. It is, is an enormous honor for, uh, I think, for Brent and Paul and me to share the platform with Hester, <clears throat> who probably is the most famous person in the world of crypto, probably more famous than Satoshi Nakamoto. She has done more, I think, to push this idea than anybody else in government. So let me uh, let me do this. I'm going to take a step back for a minute. So so I think Hester did an amazing job of walking us through some of the core legal issues that you confront as you as you think about decentralized networks. But let me take a step back and just ask the question: Why does anybody care? Like why are we doing this? So I'm going to propose several reasons for this. First is there is a deep thesis um, which is born out in the growth of the internet, which is that networks are more inclusive, more efficient, faster, cheaper and more resilient than command and control structures. And I think almost anybody at a FedSoc event is gonna share that basic impulse because I think most of us believe that markets are a better way for organizing economies than central planners. <clears throat> if you believe in that, in that impulse, then you're probably gonna believe that networks are a more efficient way of distributing just about anything than is some central distribution node, um, right? So the reason that I care about this at the OCC is that banks are kind of the ultimate central intermediaries of finance. Banks are, as I sometimes say in speeches, they're like the post office once was to information. There was a time when the only way to distribute information around the country was to write a bunch of letters, put them in envelopes, send them to a central office called the post office, and that central office would then be in charge of distributing those letters out <clears throat> to the intended recipients. Only we all know how that worked, right? It cost money, 
It took five days for a letter to get from New York to California. And a non-trivial number of times, you discovered that the letter carrier had lost the mails or had buried the mail in their backyard. It happened in a number of cases or whatever. That was a highly inefficient way of distributing mail, but it was the only way of, of communicating information at a time when technology did not exist to allow people to communicate directly. Then along came the internet <clears throat> and email was built and all of the cell phone messaging apps that we all have and everything else. And nobody in the world writes letters anymore as a result. They send messages for free and they send messages with all kinds of features on them. You can send video, you can copy multiple recipients, you can send things in a secure way or a private way or an encrypted way or whatever. And we all intuitively understand that networks now are a better way of transmitting information. What crypto is about, and I'll talk about central bank digital currency as a species of this in a moment, but what crypto is about is the idea that transmitting value is not fundamentally different from transmitting information. We now have a technology that can simultaneously maintain ledgers algorithmically, so you no longer need a bank clerk wearing eye shades to maintain ledgers in a book, but it can also do things peer to peer. So it can maintain a ledger, but also transact value directly without the need for any intermediation. This is just something that wasn't possible 20 years ago, but now it is. And blockchain is essentially the internet for the communication of value, much the same way that the first internet was an internet for the transmission of information. So we're here today talking a little bit about central bank digital currency. And I want to slightly reframe the discussion to sort of say there are two ways forward for an internet based transmission of value. One way is the government can build it. Now, this has happened in various places, um, particularly among our geopolitical competitors. China has actually done two major things to build an internet of value at the government level. One is just a few weeks ago, China announced the issuance of something called the e B, which is an internet version of the Chinese Yuan. <clears throat> Their theory is that although the dollar may be the global reserve currency, an aggressive muscle flexing China can start chipping away at the dollar by building an easier to use currency. It may not be as stable in value. It may or may not be a true reflection of the strength of the Chinese economy for various reasons, but it's super easy to use because it can transact directly across an internet transmission portal, whereas dollars have to go through <clears throat> bank clearing organizations. That's one of the things that they're thinking. The other thing that China has done is they have captured more than 51% of the mining capacity on the Bitcoin blockchain, which means that the very first internet of money, which was the Bitcoin blockchain about 10 years ago, is now essentially owned by China. <clears throat> so as a country, we now face a geostrategic competitiveness issue, which is, do we in the United States want to own internet 2.0 in the same way that we own internet 1.0? One of the reasons that information and commerce flows as freely as it does over the internet is that we didn't give it away to China at a time when we well might have. We made policy choices to incubate a networked based economy in the US and the result has been good and bad, I will admit, but it has been massive economic growth for the United States by allowing people to build on top of these networks, to self publish, to sell things quickly, to eliminate startup costs and do all the good things that the original internet brought us. Our leadership in finance is nothing like assured at this point because we have yet to embrace networks. And so now we're having a discussion in this country about two alternative choices. One is we can be a relatively slow follower to China and build our own central bank digital currency. So, so again, China issued its central bank digital currency about six weeks ago. We are talking about the possibility that our Federal Reserve could issue our own digital dollar four years from now. So consider that we're going to have a four and a half year time lag in slow following our most important global competitor into the world of electronic money. Normally, we don't want to be the slow follower. We want to be the leader or at least a fast follower. So what's the alternative to the government building a set of you know, sort of government run payment rails uh, built built on a, on a central bank token. The alternative is to do what we've always done best in this country, which is to unleash the innovative risk-taking private economy to build networks. And the good news is they've already done that. So we have a number of functioning stable coins in the United States, which are backed by dollars held in US banks, which transact over the internet. So they are dollars in the sense that all of them are fully redeemable for money held in banks. There's no question about price volatility because they are redeemable at par for a dollar. 
but they're programmable in much the same way that you can send messages on Signal and WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and, and your text messages, right? So they have all of those capacities, except that you're transmitting value and not information. These things exist today. And so as a country, we have a choice about do we want to double down on a government monopoly like China did? Two problems with that. One is government not monopolies are generally bad. And two is we're way slow out of the gate on that. Or we can do what this country does best, harness our innovative market economy and embrace the concept that there will be lots of private networks for delivering dollars in different ways, much as we all have multiple messaging apps on our phone, which allow us to send information in multiple different ways that are all useful to us for various reasons. At the OCC, the question that we have to deal with is banks are generally the transmitters of value in our society. So the question is, can banks support stablecoin projects? We've said, yes, they can. They can hold reserve deposits and provide ancillary services to ensure that these stable coins out there comply with consumer protections, don't result in bank runs and the like. Then the question is, can banks provide other normal services to cryptocurrencies? For example, can they provide custody for people who hold these assets? Again, we've said, yes, they can. We don't have a view about whether given cryptocurrencies are valuable or not, or whether they're risky or not. But like any other volatile and risky financial asset, banks have always provided a custodial service and we've said they can do that as well. There remain other questions to confront and we'll confront them over time. But I would just close by saying the most important things that are necessary if crypto and stable coins and, and some kind of digital dollar are going to exist, the most important questions are two. First, we must commit to a real and enforceable way of ensuring that crypto does not become a vector for money laundering or terrorism financing. And so we must understand that this kind of financial exchange is subject to the same kinds of national security and law enforcement issues that any other kind of value exchange is, right? These things will not work and we won't get their utility if they become vectors for criminality. So that is a critical first gating factor. But there's an equally important second gating factor if these things are to have value and grow the economy. And that is, we must understand that decentralization is the point, right? If we had embraced listservs and intranets in the early 90s, we wouldn't own the future the way that we do now on the internet. So too here, permissionless blockchains ultimately are the future in this world. Now there are individual companies and networks that will have their closed loops, much as companies in the late 80s and early 90s had their internal intranets and listservs, and those have their place. But at the end of the day, if what we're trying to do is own the internet enabled decentralized future, we need to understand that decentralization is equally important. So those are the two conundrums. We must have real law enforcement to protect our national security while also understanding that scale requires decentralization. So look forward to the discussion. I'm now gonna turn it to my friend, Brent McIntosh, the Undersecretary of the Treasury, who is a major voice on these issues and convener of all the agencies. So Brent, I'll kick it over to you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, delighted to be here today. Thanks to Paul for moderating for us and to the Federal Society for bringing us all together on this topic. Uh, I inevitably am going to sound uh, like the least enthusiastic of the three panelists, but I think that's a more product of the composition of the panel than, than anything else. We have Brian, who has a deep background here, and, and Hester, uh, who I think is changing her last name to Nakamoto after this panel. So, uh, um, but it, look, uh, Despite that fact, both Hester and Brian are right that there's a reason for immense enthusiasm here uh, in regard to these technologies, whether it is increased digital payments, digital assets, crypto, stable coins, or so-called so stable, stable coins or central bank digital currencies. These, uh, the, the developments here have the potential to create clear benefits for consumers and users uh, over the current system, um, they are driven, the, the, the move into digital currencies is driven by real pain points in the system. There can be, there can be really no question of that. Uh, there are inefficiencies, there are costs, there's time. Settlement time is too long for, uh, for individual transactions. Um, and there, uh, the, these technologies have the potential to expand uh, financial inclusion to many of the unbanked. So there are immense uh, promise here in terms of cost efficiency inclusion. Um, you already see that across uh, places where there's been uh, massive adoption of digital payment systems, including for example, the M-Pesa in Africa. Um, so there, there is a possibility of rapid, 
broad scale adoption, including internationally of these technologies. But that said, with rapid broad scale adoption, uh, that, that rapid broad scale adoption can be self-threatening if it's not designed well, if the payment mechanisms are not designed well, if the assets are not designed well. If, uh, if it lacks, if a payment mechanism lacks meaningful user protections, that's an easy way to undermine confidence in that payment mechanism. Um, and that would be a huge problem uh, to begin with. And if the payment mechanism were adopted at scale, it could actually have systemic consequences. Um, if, uh, if it creates financial stability risks, that would be a problem uh, if, if adopted at scale and the potential for financial stability risks uh, were to come to pass, that would be a problem that could be global in scale. Similarly, as Brian identified, if, if the payment mechanisms here become a route for money laundering, sanctions evasion, tax evasion, uh, or illicit finance, that also will undermine the efficacy of these, these payment mechanisms. So uh, in some ways, uh, the design of the mechanisms and the regulatory and supervisory approaches we apply to them uh, have the potential to ensure the success of these systems or to imperil the success of these systems uh, and with it to ensure or imperil the benefits that would flow from uh, digital assets. Uh, so when we look at the, the rise of these uh, technologies and the evolution of these technologies from the standpoint of uh, the U.S. regulatory community and even the international regulatory community, we see a series of age-old imperatives that, although the technology is evolving, the imperatives apply just the same here. Those are things like uh, things that Brian mentioned, money laundering and illicit finance, ensuring that this is not a, a sort of digital free-for-all uh, for behaviors that we in the United States have spent a great deal of time stamping out uh, and working to stamp out. Um, that's ensuring that there is uh, user protections built in here. So for example, we're thinking about questions like uh, the reserve that backs a stable coin uh, uh, and the composition of that reserve and the reserve requirements. Similarly, the, the Financial Stability Board, which is an international body that grew out of the global financial crisis, has been looking at the potential financial stability consequences of a, uh, most recently, of a stable coin that were adopted at scale uh, and used around the world and became a, a sort of international currency. Um, there are concerns as well around data privacy here uh, and operational resilience and cybersecurity that are clearly present here in a way that are they're not present with current, uh, current Fed reserves or cash. And so those are questions that need to be resolved in a meaningful way to ensure the success of these systems. And then obviously, uh, I would be remiss as, uh, as a Treasury Department official, unless I pointed out that we want to collect taxes. Uh, this should not be a tax-free zone. Uh, so uh, whatever level of taxation you believe is appropriate, it's not a tax-free zone uh, just because you stick cyber or crypto in front of the currency name. Um, and so governments have uh, rules to address these sorts of concerns in the existing system, and they need to think thoughtfully and quickly about how to apply those rules in the cyber domain and how to apply them with regard to these new and evolving technologies, whether it be uh, the cryptocurrencies uh, that have were, uh, very, were and remain very prominent, the possibility of a stable coin that we were adopted at scale or a central bank digital currency. Um, so the Financial Stability Board has done a good deal of work looking at, uh, and I, I worked on this uh, work, looking at how we should apply those sorts of principles in, in to evolving technologies and how to take a situation where a new technology is accomplishing the same uh, business as a prior, te uh, prior technology, whether it be cash or some other uh, commercial bank money, um, and poses the same risks, it should comply with the same rules. Um, and how exactly to make that work in a, in a rapidly evolving technology set is uh, uh, something that regulators around the world are working on intently. Um, and then there's obviously, from the perspective, we don't have the Fed here today, but there's obviously a question for central banks about the role of private currencies in monetary policy and monetary sovereignty and their ability to continue to use monetary policy as a tool of economic growth and financial stability 
in a situation where, for example, there were cross-border adoption of a, of a particular private or central bank issued digital currency. Um, we in the United States have, have an obvious interest in monetary sovereignty and the, the role of the dollar. Um, uh, and so when we think about that, we, there's, there are obvious questions for the Fed to address uh, with regard to these uh, technologies. I'll just turn for a moment to central bank digital currency, CBDCs, um, which I think there's some, um, it's not always clear what exactly we're talking about there. And with regard to central bank digital currencies, we're talking about a sort of uh, third form of central bank money. It's not cash. It's not the sort of uh, bank reserves held at the Fed that are, uh, that are the other form of central bank digital currency. It's a, uh, in the forms being talked about now, we're talking about actually consumer used uh, 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 central bank money, uh, whether it be tokenized or, or uh, account based. Um, and a number of central banks, as, as Brian pointed out, are studying this. The Bank for International Settlements recently put out a principles paper which was done in conjunction with the Fed and the European Central Bank and the Bank of England and, and several other central banks to think through the, the public policy questions that arise out of a central bank digital currency. Um, these are public policy questions that are not just questions for central banks. They're really questions for, uh, uh, for the, the governments and the people of various countries to think through. Because as Brian points out, a central bank digital currency does provide the central bank and thus the government a great deal of uh, a great deal of power. Uh, it provides a great deal of insight into all the transactions that are happening, awareness of those transactions, potentially the ability to control those transactions or stop those transactions. Uh, and that power could be used in some instances for good, but it could certainly be used for malign purposes. Uh, and I think that when we look at the rise of central bank digital currencies in some non-market economies, the possibility of using those for malign purposes is, is very real. Um, and then there's, of course, uh, questions about uh, the, the, if, if a central bank is issuing a digital currency, whether that uh, causes disintermediation in the financial system and, and bank disintermediation, and the question of whether then there's a, a harm to the provision of private credit in the system. Uh, and these are, these are hard questions that we need to work through as we consider the possibility of a central bank digital currency. There was a very interesting discussion this week between uh, or among uh, Chairman Powell, uh, Madam Lagarde, and Andrew Bailey, who's the uh, governor of the Bank of England, about these topics. And uh, you know, the, 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 the position they all took was that these are not replacements for cash. Um, they, uh, they're intended to be done in a way that doesn't preempt cash or other digital currencies if they issue a central bank digital currency. Uh, Chair Powell said he's, quote, committed to carefully evaluating the benefits of a CBDC, uh, and it's a question we'll approach with great care. Um, and the main focus for him is on whether the CBDC would improve a dynamic and stable payment system. Uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, pointed out that there are real questions of monetary sovereignty. And one of the reasons the EU would want to adopt a, uh, a central bank digital currency is autonomy for the euro area. And I think we, we have a sense for what that means. So um, that's all to say um, there is a, there's a lot of thinking to be done about central bank digital currencies. Brian pointed out that one of the um, uses that the Chinese aspire to, we think, with a central bank with a digital RMB is the displacement of the dollar. There's also within China a domestic purpose for a central bank digital currency, which is uh, that the, uh, a certain jealousy of the, the pride of place held right now by Alipay and WePay there. And the fact that the Chinese government is not a part of that process and the desire to have greater control there. So this is all to say uh, both private sector cryptocurrencies and stable coins and central bank digital currencies could have real benefits. They also pose substantial public policy challenges that need to be addressed at the front end before we get ourselves in, a, in an untenable position. And they need to be addressed internationally with our counterparts in, throughout the uh, international regulatory and supervisory community because they present they are inherently cross-border they uh, create cross-border externalities and they need cross-border collaboration. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on at finance ministries and central banks around the world to address those concerns. Uh, and I'm sure we can delve into those more as we go forward with further discussion of the panel and take questions from the attendees. Thanks very much. 
Right. Well, thank you, Mr. Undersecretary, for that, and also to the controller and commissioner for uh, uh, your remarks as well. So one, uh, just one point, just of uh, housekeeping here to the attendees. I noticed we had a few questions, but then it looked like you all uh, unraised your hands. So if you want to ask, a, pose a question here, please uh, use that uh, hand raising feature, and that'll show up uh, for me that that you're interested in asking a question. And, and please leave it. Um, raised there so that uh, that we can tell that uh, you have that question. Uh, with respect to, uh, let me just do another plug for CLE here, because uh, a lot of you are obviously interested in that. Uh, the code is Uh, so thank you very much. Well, one thing before we go into uh, the uh, central bank digital currency discussion in more detail, which I think there's a lot to unpack on that, I thought maybe we should uh, you know, st start at a kind of a, a, a level, basic level, and thanks to Hester, you did a, a, a great job in kind of laying out the issues with securities law. But uh, at the same time, the, recently the administration put out the national strategy for critical and emerging technology, which listed distributed ledger technology as, uh, you know, an important uh, aspect for the United States uh, that uh, that is, uh, you know, critical for our leadership in the world. So I wanted to ask you all as far as just in general, so the uh, blockchain distributed ledger technology, you all touched on this in, in different ways. But I, I assume that you all agree that that's a, uh, a, a vital part for, um, you know, uh, guarding America's uh, technological prowess going forward. And then uh, secondly, um, I was wondering if you all could touch on, you know, where you think the real critical uh, touch points are as far as ensuring that the United States can develop it. Some are regulatory, maybe some are technologic, some are, you know, inherent maybe in our system of uh, rules and regulations regarding, you know, what's criminal and what's not, and obviously um, what's a security and what's not. Um, different countries have different uh, perceptions of that. But just uh, just quickly, I was wondering, uh, you know, if you all, if we could level set, uh, you know, with a Respect to, with respect to DLT. So maybe go in the order that we did before. So Madam Commissioner. Sure, I think that the technology is technology that we wanna have developed here in the US. I think um, the, the main barrier to it being developed here is regulatory clarity, which is something I think that all of us are thinking about. Um, but I think absent that, um, people would wanna do the development here in the US. And Mr. Controller? Yeah, well, um, th there certainly is a big issue of U.S. versus other parts of the world. There, there are uh, parts of the world, uh, Singapore being my favorite example, that are uh, very growth oriented. It's sort of like, you know, that book, That Used to Be Us. I, I look at Singapore and I ask myself, do we still have the risk-taking dynamism that we had 50 years ago, let's say? Could we put a man on the moon today? I, I, I don't know, but I hope so. There definitely are other competitors who are racing to provide regulatory clarity so that people will go there and build this stuff. And here, where we seem to be embracing ambiguity, that's less likely. I would just say one other quick thing, Paul, and that is that um, in the US, among people who don't have a deep thesis for crypto, you often hear people talk about, well, I'm for blockchain, I'm just not for crypto. So when I hear phrases like distributed ledger technology, which is not a phrase that has ever been uttered in Silicon Valley, what I think that is code for is I'm pro blockchain, but I'm anti crypto. So let me just level set for people who are not deeply educated in this. There's no such thing as blockchain without crypto. Crypto is the native asset that induces people to solve the puzzles that result in validating transactions. It's the only reason people plug their computer into the network in order to do the transaction validation that occurs. So don't be fooled by people who say I'm pro blockchain and anti crypto. You know, you wouldn't have stablecoin networks without the Ethereum token. That's what led to the development of the Ethereum network on which all of these stablecoins are built. And so we do really need the clarity Hester's talking about because without it, there won't be blockchain. And so we can't think of the blockchain as the, as the infrastructure. It's the ecosystem of tokens and networks uh, that, is, that is the national infrastructure on this. Yes, okay. Brent, you have a... 
Yeah, I don't have a lot to add beyond that. But the one thing I'll say on that is, you know, the United States has been a technology leader for many years, uh, and it will continue to be a technology leader with regard to these technologies. Um, It's also been a leader in regulatory approaches to financial integrity, and it will continue to be a regulatory leader in approaches to financial integrity as we evolve into these uh, areas. And I can I can tell you just from having discussed with my international colleagues, they are looking to us for the question of how to apply things like know your customer requirements and anti-money laundering requirements in this space. And so we will have a leadership role in formulating those rules for technologies developed here or technologies developed elsewhere, at least among the responsible like-minded countries. And Brian mentioned Singapore, uh, one of the one of the projects we were working on at the Financial Stability Board was a regulatory review of stable coins. And that was co-led by, uh, by me and my uh, counterpart in Singapore. Uh, so they're, they're clearly thinking, they're forward leaning on this, but they're also thinking carefully about the, the important public policy imperatives that are, uh, that are relevant to the evolution of these technologies. Well, so uh, so to follow up on all of that, obviously it's uh, you know it's a big world, and uh, and none of this really knows any borders, of course, as far as uh, you know where things go. And you've pointed out, uh, Brian pointed out uh, rightfully, Singapore is uh, also its own leader. But in the United States here too, we have fifty states that also have their own uh, views, various views about all of this. And Brian, you've been a real leader as far as innovation on the federal level, and uh, especially with respect to um, custody and and allowing now uh, uh, national banks to be custodians of of, uh, cryptocurrencies, um, at least ones that are not uh, securities. Uh, And I was wondering uh, that how you all view uh, the uh, the federalism uh, aspect here in the United States uh, with the various jurisdictions, because there are, you know, there's a, a solution for a lot of the uh, 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 various uh, uh, approaches, and that's a preemption at the federal level, which, of course, people in Congress don't like to ever talk about necessarily. Um, so I'm curious, you know, A, you know, if we, what we need to do with our own housekeeping here in the United States. And then B, as Brent was mentioning, you know, with respect to the FSB and other uh, supranational uh, groups, even though the FSB is not really subject to treaty or anything like that, but do we, uh, you know, how do we approach this uh, uh, jurisdictional difference? Uh, it, it's a great question, Paul. I mean, my, my lens on this, um, which is, I guess, different from <clears throat> Brent's and Hester's, is the OCC has a unique role in this country of, of chartering financial institutions. So, um, you know, we're not just a regulator promulgating rules and policies. We actually get to create banks is, is kind of the core role of, of my office. And so um, here, the way we think about it is most companies that are involved in crypto businesses are licensed as state money transmitters. Many of them have a license in New York that's called the bit license, you know. Uh, But the problem with these licenses is that they only extend to the state border. And so, you know, as I discovered in my former job at a crypto company, we had to maintain money transmission licenses in all 46 states that required them. Plus, we had to have a state trust company in New York. Plus, we had to have all of these other things. So there were enormous frictions imposed by state by state regulation when you're doing a large global business. That doesn't mean there's not an important role for the states. One of our strengths as a country, obviously, uh, indeed, the the uh, nom de plume of this organization, right, is, is federalism. We have small units where laboratories of democracy can occur and we can experiment and see what works. And that's a good thing. But it's also true, as Hamilton taught us, you know, 200 years ago, that for us to compete with the great powers of the world, we have to be a big economy, not just a local economy. And so the nature of crypto which, as you say, knows no borders, where the whole point is there is a common unit of exchange on all sides of a border, um, requires a larger playing field than any given state. So the way we're looking at it is thinking about what our national bank powers are, because national banks do have preemption. They are able to operate across state lines, irrespective of state substantive law on most aspects of their operations. And so if national banks can be involved in blockchain, if they can custody these assets, if they can plug into stablecoin blockchains, if they can support stablecoin and other crypto projects, 
um, then it's possible for this to become a national infrastructure. Absent that, it will never be a national infrastructure because New York will take a different view from Wyoming, and that will be a big problem. Indeed, when I give that example, that, that is a big problem because you have Wyoming, a state that is very pro-crypto, that has now started licensing crypto banks. Um, and then you have New York, a state that is much more enforcement oriented, that is much more focused on sort of constraining rather than growing some of these innovations. So at some level, when this is big enough and important enough for us, it will have to uh, grow inside of the national banking system, the only nationwide charter that we have. Interesting. Hester, do you have any uh, thoughts on this, especially with respect to uh, how the SEC approaches this and then with all the, the various states? Well, I think that, that um, in this instance, we can learn from what some of the states are doing. I mean, Wyoming, which Brian mentioned, has been really out front and trying to think about a way to create a framework um, that would allow it to regulate the, the crypto businesses in its state. And I think we have a lot to learn from that example. So that's a reminder to me um, of the importance of of. The, the idea of laboratories of democracy. At the same time, I think in, in this area and others, there are times when I think it's important for us to exercise preemption so that we can have a marketplace that works. Um, you know, for example, we, we have a, a, a framework for private offerings, exempt, uh, exemptive framework. And in a lot of those instances, I think it makes sense for us to exercise our authority to preempt the state laws so that you can have a functioning secondary market. Um, and so that some of those same concepts will apply here in the crypto space. Okay, well, thanks. Brent? I'll only add that, I think those are, those are great points. I'll only add that uh, Treasury did a review early in the administration of various aspects of financial regulation. And one of the things Treasury looked at in, in the fourth of four reports we put out on that was, uh, the evolution of fintech, and there was a recognition in that report that there was a need for uh, nationwide certainty and some to to promote the evolution of some of these technologies if we want to stay a technology leader in the United States. Great. All right. Well, let, let, why don't we turn quickly to a question from the audience? And there are a whole number of uh, question questioners who have raised their hands. So let's start uh, at the top. Michelle Roberts. Uh, uh, we can. If we can open your mic. Um, good afternoon, Michelle Roberts of BlackRock. This is a question for Commissioner Pierce. After the SEC shut down the Telegram ICO, where subscribers were leading venture capital firms like Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia, accredited investors, not the retail munchy users, I didn't think an ICO could survive, but I think you opened your remarks by mentioning some recent ICOs under Reg A. Could you please elaborate and explain the difference between those Reg A ICOs and Telegram? Well, so what Telegram was trying to do is they raised money, as you mentioned, from accredited investors um, to get the project up and running. And then when they were ready to have the network actually launched, the idea was to get the tokens into the hands of, of the broader world. And at that point, um, that second token distribution event, we came in, we, the SEC came in and we said, you can't do that. Um, I objected to that. I thought that, that um, the, the approach of a lot of raising money initially privately and then then building the network and then going out publicly is is not a bad approach at all um, and and it's one that the safe harbor that I talked about that I've been um, that I that I proposed and that I'm hoping will get some uptake that would allow that kind of a framework to work really well where you raise money privately um, and then once you're ready to launch you have a, a, a way to launch. Now, what some other projects have done is they have used Reg A, which is, as I mentioned, um, there we have we have public offerings, but we also have private offerings that are that are um, you can raise money under exemptions from registration, and so Regulation A is one of those exemptions. It's it's been referred to, as I mentioned, as a as a mini IPO. So you're still doing. Um, disclosure and and that process is one that runs through the SEC and you're interacting with the SEC staff as they're looking at your disclosure documents um, at your registration and so that is an approach that some 
projects have taken, my concern about that approach. And again, if it works for people, that's fantastic. Um, but my concern is that once you get through that process, then your your token is a security, which means it's subject to all of the requirements about how securities um, can 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 move from one hand to the, to another. And so it really does mean that then the the tokens in that network will will be um, a security and will be constrained by the securities laws until such a point as perhaps, um, someone can come in and say, now this network is totally decentralized and there's no need for this token anymore to be governed by the securities laws because there's no longer an asymmetry of information. There's no central party that has information that people buying that, that token would need to have in order to make a good decision about whether to buy it. Uh, we haven't seen a token go from the point of being deemed to be a security to being unclassified as a security. Um, it, it maybe when that happens, that will make the Reg A route a more attractive route for people to take. Well, and, and just, oh, sorry. Uh, just to add uh, a, uh, a point to that, the Reg A offering, I remember the, uh, the CEO of uh, the company that uh, uh, went through that uh, made a remark that uh, he, the millions of dollars that he spent on supposedly what's supposed to be a very cheap way, inexpensive way for uh, smaller companies to, to go public uh, was his contribution to the whole effort of uh, trying to get things uh, normalized. And uh, so, you know, it's, uh, it's not an easy route. And especially because the way the SEC has approached things has been very, um, uh, it's, let's say it's not rule-based. It's not even uh, formal guidance. It's really regulation by speechifying almost um, as far as clarification of, uh, you know, what is and is not a security, Bitcoin, Ether, and whatnot. So, uh, Hester, one, one follow-up. I, I do think that that point that you just made is an important one. I mean, clearly the first, the first projects to take the Reg A route are going to, um, they're going to do a lot of the work, which later should smooth the way for, for future Reg A offerings. So it may end up being a more attractive route for future projects. I'm sorry, what were you going to say, Paul? No, well, and, well actually, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, one aspect of that was, uh, you know, the, the limits for uh, Reg A, you know, the upper limit. So um, so we just, we just raised in a recent rulemaking, we just raised the upper limit from 50 to 75 million. And so you can spread the costs of capital raising over a larger a larger amount of capital that you're bringing in. And so we hope that that will make reggae more attractive, not only in this space, but just more generally to, um, to companies trying to raise capital. Great. Well, let's turn to another questioner and this one may be, will be a banking one, uh, uh, Wayne A. You're on mute. Thank you very much for this very interesting and I will say also very important panel. Appreciate all of your participation. I wanna follow up on a point that uh, Comptroller Brooks made and that is when you compared trans the internet as a means for communication but also now a means for transferring a value. And my concern really is really has been been raised in recent months where we have seen government and private parties inserting themselves into that transfer of communication and engaging in various forms of censorship or otherwise blocking that free kind of communication. Can we be confident that if the internet becomes this kind of means of transferring value that you talk about, Mr. Comptroller, that we could be free of government or other inter parties, in essence, engaging in financial censorship or other types of interference in that free flow of value amongst the different parties that are participating. And is perhaps maybe the solution, which we don't have so much in communication, is a very vigorous field of competition where you have many different parties that are playing significant roles so that no party can block out other individuals. That's my question, but I appreciate your views on that. Thank you. Well, well, first of all, Wayne, you've always been a hero of mine and now you're even more of a hero of mine. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, what I would say about that is the problem with internet 1.0 is not the internet. 
The problem is Internet 1.0 is not decentralized, right? So, so like the Internet is not censoring speech. Twitter is censoring speech and Facebook is censoring. There's a small number of gigantic intermediaries that took over the Internet. So if you if you go and live in Silicon Valley, as I did for two years, which, by the way, is a mind blowing experience for people like us, um, you will learn certain things. And one is the idea that Internet 1.0 was a uh, partial success, but a significant failure for the reason you say. We allowed a small number of giant authorities to amass enormous power under the protection of Section 230, you know, which is now such an issue of hot debate, because those companies are not passive uh, maintainers of an internet. They are actually uh, sort of competitors in a debate. Internet 2.0 was supposed to be different from that. Internet 2.0 was supposed to be the information internet where all of us were able to freely do whatever we want, to post whatever we want uncensored. People out in Silicon Valley talk about crypto as internet 3.0 for that reason. So yes, it must be truly decentralized. That, that, is, that, that is really the key. The issue is building decentralization first. So as I say at the outset, the two things necessary for this to succeed are A, to solve the money laundering law enforcement issues, but B, to have a truly permissionless, truly decentralized internet of value where there are no intermediaries who exercise the kind of power that Twitter and Facebook uh, uh, issue. So I, I think your point is extraordinarily well taken. Uh, Brent, you have a... Yeah, uh, I would just uh, add on this one that this is a, an important consideration when we think about central bank digital currencies uh, as well. And when we were talking earlier about the, the possibility of internationalization of, the, of, a, uh, a, uh, uh, of an RMB, a digital RMB, there are a number of reasons why uh, the current design of their ERMB is not easily conducive to internationalization, including the capital controls uh, that currently apply to the RMB. But that said, there's another uh, issue with internationalization of the RMB, and it's exactly this. It's government control of the transactions. And it's one thing if you're a, uh, a, a Chinese national and you are subject to the immense government control that uh, takes place in China, uh, that, that's a problem uh, of one scale. But why would you, if you were a, a person in a, a third country, why would you possibly want to use a digital RMB when uh, you're subject to the Chinese government knowing all of your transactions and having the possibility to shut them down uh, and assigning you essentially uh, conceivably a social credit score in the same way that uh, is assigned to uh, Chinese nationals. So I, I think this is a huge question for uh, the evolution in this space. And it's one that applies not just to the private sector technologies, but to the central bank technologies as well. Yeah, no, that's, uh, thank you. That's definitely a, a cause of concern as far as privacy and uh, anonymity, the values that we uh, hold dear in this country, which is a common uh, objection, of course, to, to uh, CBDCs. Um, uh, as far as, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Lindsay Friedman is, has a question. I apologize, I have my wife's name on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, thank you all for the discussion. I was curious, um, one of the practical concerns that I have with respect to cryptocurrencies um, being truly decentralized is, uh, for example, last night I sent a wire. It didn't arrive timely to the recipient. And so I was on the phone uh, with the bank saying, did I press in the right account number? And so I'm curious what sort of practical or legal solutions are available when people are truly out in the desert and, and on their own uh, in a truly decentralized network where so much value is being exchanged. Thank you. Uh, Brian, Brent? Well, I, I, I'm happy to, to uh, try and comment on that. So first question I always ask in almost any setting is, so consider the alternative. So what I'm hearing you say, <clears throat> which I think we've all experienced is, the existing banking system is pretty clunky. So I, I don't think to justify uh, crypto as, as an alternative, that we have to show that it's not clunky. We have to recognize that the existing system is quite clunky and crypto may or may not be better in its clunkiness quotient. So let's start with that. 
then I will tell you that the places in the world where crypto actually is used in a way that it isn't in the U.S. Because to be clear, in the U.S., crypto is mostly seen as an investment asset. That's why Hester is such a hugely important voice on this. But if you go to other parts of the world, like Venezuela, for example, or uh, parts of Africa, um, uh, you know, refugee camps in Bangladesh, uh, uh, another great example, people are actually using these things to transact with each other. And the reason they're doing so is because there's no bank required. They can transact directly on their cell phone. So, you know, it's not really a thing in the world of blockchain where you, you think you sent the money, but the money didn't go. The reason that happens in the banking system is normally you have to have two-factor authentication and an in-call from your bank to confirm the wire. And so, yes, once all of those things have happened, the wire moves almost instantaneously, but a whole lot of things have to happen first. Whereas in a world of crypto, that's just not so. In a world of crypto, if you have a private wallet on your phone, you can literally hit one tap and it will instantly update the blockchain to show a transfer from your wallet to the other person's wallet. That's just not a thing. So, so by its nature, you know, the lack of a, the need for an intermediary is what makes it inherently faster than, than banking. Now, it's also, to Brent's point, what makes it inherently riskier. That's the part that we're still figuring out, I think, as regulators. But to your point, it is inherently faster by the, because of the nature of what a blockchain is. Hester, Brent, any thoughts on that? or? Just to say, uh, I agree with what Brian said, and this is one of the public policy challenges we face in terms of user protection. Uh, and there's, it's not inherently uh, riskier than our, or, or clunkier, uh, to use Brian's term, than our current system. But it's, it's a, this is a question we need to work on to develop a system in which uh, people can have confidence that their uh, assets are there and that when they transfer them, they go to the right place, and we're not going to have a sort of Mount Gox situation. Okay. Thank you. Is there any thought? Or I'll move on if not. Well, I mean, I would just say that I think one of the benefits of this technology is you can have everything open source, so you know what the, the software is. Um, and then another benefit is that because of the nature of a blockchain you really you you have a record of where everything is 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 going so that's um a benefit of course you can always make mistakes about if you direct your money to the wrong to the wrong address you can have the same kind of problems that you could have in another situation um but but i think there are it are inherent advantages to this technology and you can hear uh, perhaps in the future just like we have with credit cards the calls of uh consumer protection folks who will want to have some sort of uh, a limit, perhaps on uh, uh, on liability for the people for the you know transfer order um, but uh, and that again will have global implications it's one thing if it's a, a domestic sort of uh, issue and, and and other if it's not so you know we'll see um, one thing I I did want to ask about too speaking of clunkiness, is uh, we have a, uh, a lot of people say, well, why do we need a central bank digital currency? We have basically a digital dollar. We have, uh, you know, transfers, wire transfers, the Fed wire, which speaking of clunkiness and slowness and mistakes, it's sort of like Brian's discussion of the post office. Uh, and then the, the clearinghouse has uh, spent billions of dollars at the Fed's urging to come up with a real-time payments uh, uh, program. And uh, but then they've run into a buzzsaw of objections now, and the Fed has announced that it will work on its own equivalent of that to be available in something like four years, or if if it'll even uh, occur then. So leaving aside the central bank digital currency, which maybe they're working on concurrently. So Brian, I see you smiling. I was wondering uh, if you have any uh, any thoughts on this. Oh, Paul, <clears throat> I'm just shaking my head in disbelief. I mean. I, I, it's hard for me to believe I'm old enough to make these kinds of comments, but you know, I remember that there was a time, like when I first started practicing law, uh, we didn't yet have email. Um, we actually had only just gotten computers the year before I joined the firm, but we didn't have email. And when email first came along, um, a lot of the older partners in the firm said, we already have fax machines. We already have instantaneous information transmission. What do we need email for? We have faxes. People really believe that. 
And by the way, you know, one thing that many people forget is when we first got, um, I think, I think maybe I'm the oldest person on this panel other than you. So, uh, so maybe, uh, maybe I'm the only one who remembers this. When email first became a thing, the American Bar Association came out with a, a guidance document for lawyers that said, and this was enforced for about two years, starting in the early 90s, that lawyers couldn't transmit confidential information by email because to do so would waive the privilege because that email would travel over other people's servers. And so that was a privilege waiver. Now, that sounds absurd today, but it actually was an ABA canon for a couple of years between like 1994 and 1996. You can check it out. So my basic view is when we say, well, we've already got uh, real-time payments because we've got wires. Well, try sending a wire overseas and see how real-time that is. It typically takes two to five days for a transfer across the SWIFT network to actually clear to your counterparty in another country. So try doing that. Or try being an immigrant and doing a remittance back home to Guatemala. What you'll discover is there's no wire solution for you there. There you're going to Western Union and you're paying an enormous fee plus a foreign exchange conversion charge in order to accomplish that. Right. It's basically all saying we've got the fax machine. And one other statement, uh, you know, on, on your comment about the clearinghouse and everything, the clearinghouse development is terrific. I mean, it's 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 faster payments. It has limited geographic penetration and it has one thing that is super anti competitive compared to um, our foreign competitors, which is the only people who can use it are banks. There you go. That is an important distinction. Brent? Yeah, if you need any more evidence that uh, that there's a need for innovation in this space, it's that uh, a whole bunch of central banks right now are looking at the question of how to solve the cross-border payments problem uh, in a big uh, uh, effort run by uh, by John Cunliffe, the deputy governor of the Bank of England, uh, over the course of the coming year to plan out how to solve these cross-border problems because they're uh, they are immense problems that haven't been solved and, uh, and create all the pain points and more uh, that Brian just described. Esther? I don't have anything to add on this one. Okay. They said it well. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's move to another question. Um, there's uh, um, Carol Van. Do you have the mic? It's muted. Uh, well, hearing nothing, uh, then, uh, then let's move to uh, Ron Heeman. All right, awesome. Um, thank you very much for taking time. Uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces that I worked with during my time with Representative Davidson. Uh, so this question is for both Commissioner Pierce as well as Acting Comptroller Brooks. Um, you guys mentioned a lot of different state-by-state -state regulations and guidances. Uh, NYDFS recently came out with a letter saying that firms need to start assessing their climate risk and develop uh, approaches to mitigate them, especially in terms of Bitcoin mining. And there's been a 2019 study that says Bitcoin mining could result in a two degree Celsius increase in global temperatures down the road. Now, mind you, it's about 75% of Bitcoin mining is powered by renewables. But with the incoming administration placing a large importance on climate change, are regulators looking at the climate change impacts of uh, Bitcoin and other digital assets that utilize proof of work concepts? Well, uh, Paul, I'm, I'm probably the designated spear catcher on that one. Um, so uh, let, let's see, Ron, the, the lightweight answer probably is to say that, um, you know, we're not that many years away from the last Bitcoin being mined, at which point, as you know, the Bitcoin blockchain is going to transition to a different way of validating transactions. So this is this may be a little bit of the horse has already left the barn, but it's, uh, you know, we're sort of it, it may not matter a year from now. Um, and as uh, people on the on the conference here may or may not know, many, really most of the crypto projects nowadays are not built on top of mining platforms. They're either proof of stake tokens or they have some other, uh, some, some other means of validation. So th this is a, it, I don't wanna say it's not a big deal, but it's a, it's a limited deal, limited in time in various ways. And again, I would come back to the fact that most of the, uh, not 90%, not, not but more than 50% of the Bitcoin mining uh, activity occurs in China. So there's not a ton we can do with it. Um, I will just say on the broader question of how do we think about climate risk as something in the financial system that needs to be dealt with or, or managed, um, at the OCC, we make a distinction between financial risk created by climate change. So for example, the fact that you might own, uh, you might have a loan secured by collateral property that's in a coastal area 
where rising sea levels will cause the first floor to be underwater some of the time, as in some Miami apartment buildings. Or, you know, you might live in a place that is subject to uh, hurricanes of some kind and you need to assess your collateral. That's a place where we expect banks to have risk management. Those are direct financial risks to their books, et cetera. Where I get off the bus a little bit is when people start talking about how banks have a job uh, to affirmatively solve the climate crisis. You know, I, I think that government works best and market works best where people uh, do what they're assigned to do, right? So we're not the EPA. We don't have any special knowledge about whether we're going to migrate away from fossil fuels or whether fossil fuels will be part of our mix for a long time. Uh, I don't have scientists on staff who can assess how risky this activity is versus another or to balance the pros and cons of climate change versus energy independence. And so what we focus on over here is the banking system and, and doing that well. The joke I have is some of you may have seen how the Centers for Disease Control issued a national foreclosure and eviction moratorium. That would be like if I put out some, uh, some guidance on vaccines or something. I mean, they don't know anything about evictions and foreclosures and I don't know anything about climate change other than I know what the financial risks are. And so in that limited way, absolutely we're on that along with our fellow regulators but in the broader way of solving climate change you know that's why we have environmental regulators and the congress i, I would argue okay well thank you anyone else uh, to, okay well thank you let's uh i wanted to turn uh real quickly to the whole uh privacy anonymity aspect uh of these uh central bank digital currencies or the lack of uh and the, then the threat perhaps of of uh, government using it for, um, you know, let's say non-democrat friendly, democratic friendly uh, type of uh, uses, uh, sort of a 1984 issue. Um, you all kind of touched on this, but uh, you know, as far as what sort of protections uh, could be built into the system, especially if it's done from the central bank, the Chinese have sort of a two-level um, aspect, which in that country is hardly a protection, we could say, um, but uh, is there anything that we could do on this side um, that might even then make, of course, our CBDC, if we have one, more attractive than others? I guess, uh, Paul, I'll, I'll jump in on that. And uh, ultimately, I defer to our friends at the Fed on, on how you would design a CBDC that doesn't pose those sorts of problems. But I think that the, the good news is because we live in a country with a commitment to those sorts of freedoms and with the rule of law, I'm confident that with the right design choices, we or the Bank of England uh, or, or other like-minded partners could come up with a scheme where there were protections around the data in question and it had uh, uses only and it was able to be used and accessed only in certain circumstances the way we do with other uh, forms of uh, sensitive data. Uh, I don't have the same confidence that even if those rules were in place uh, in some other countries that they would be applied. Uh, and so I think that I think that this is one of the hard design choices uh, and, and challenges we face, but I'm confident we could overcome it. I, I don't know that we would have confidence that a lot of other places that there, I mean, there are a lot of places I would say where we don't have confidence that they would overcome it. Right. Um, anyone else have a thought on that? Brian? Well, yeah, I, I, I guess I would chime in for a minute. I mean, I, I, I have said for a long time that um, we, we need to do some deep soul searching in this country about how to balance two really important um, and yet incompatible objectives. One is, um, of course, we have important national security objectives. We want to be safe in this country. We don't want uh, terrorists, you know, using our system against us, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a core privacy value. In, in this country, and I, I, I'm pretty, pretty hawkish about that, and I'm actually pretty worried when I look out there uh, at the way our world is moving in this country about how much of a zone of privacy is left. Um, I mean, you don't want to hear. I mean, you, you all have privately heard my various coronavirus rants, but I ask myself a lot of days: Are there any limits left on what the government can do? You know, yeah. I mean, the reason that we have cash, or at least one reason people like to preserve cash, is. There are some non-illegal but embarrassing things that we want to go buy and we don't want somebody to know about it. And so we have cash. Um, in crypto land, people say a cashless society is a surveillance society. And so on the one hand, I, I, I don't want people to be able to fund Al-Qaeda 
using a secret privacy token. On the other hand, I don't necessarily want the government to see everything I'm doing all the time. So what's the right balance of that? And the easiest way to think about it is if you look at totalitarian states, it's obvious, uh, I think, that privacy uh, and especially privacy shield tokens are a good thing. You don't want Venezuelans to be rounded up and go to jail because they made a contribution to the Guaido uh, uh, you know, shadow government, right? You want them to be able to do that. That's clearly freedom fighting. It's murkier in the US because somehow we tell ourselves that we have this heritage of open democracy, but you know, man, you've seen people out there in some of these Antifa protests and things. I, I'm not so sure, I'm not so sure. And sometimes using technology as a bulwark, it's like, why do we have the second amendment? It's not because it's legal to go shoot people, but the idea that there is an armed populace makes it less likely the government will come after you, right? And at some level, there are bulwarks against government encroachment that we should at least take seriously. So I might be the wacko on the panel about that, but I do think we need to carefully balance those two goals. No, I think that's a good point. I mean, look at how the IRS is being, uh, you know, misused by the Obama administration, Franklin Roosevelt, you know, perhaps Richard Nixon and others, but to be <laughs> bipartisan there. But, uh, but yeah, I think that's a very good point. Anyone else have a last point? Because we're at time here. Any chiming in? Okay. All right. Well, uh, you all have been, uh, we have other, a, a bunch of other questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's question, um, but uh, you all have been a, a great audience. It's too bad that we can't do this in person and a wonderful panel. So uh, Mr. Controller, Madam Commissioner, Mr. Undersecretary, thank you very much uh, for lending your time to the Federal Society and to help explicate this uh, very interesting area. And so again, I just wanted to remind everybody about uh, CLE credits uh, um, as, as far as uh, you know, the passcode. So be sure to get your credits. So thank you all very much uh, for your time and your energy and your thoughts and uh, good luck and God bless everybody. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks everybody.